Adam, welcome to Stories in AI. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you, Ganesh. Thank you so much for taking the time. This has been, uh, I've been waiting for this conversation and all my research and uh, about you and what you have done. It's just amazing. Why did you start us off with your story? I mean, you're for you gave us, you gave the world Siri and Bixby for that matter. So tell us your personal story. Uh, sure. So I don't quite know where to start, but generally I've been in computer science for a long time, working in artificial intelligence pretty much since sophomore year in college. Um, I uh, worked in research. So I was at SRI International, Stanford Research Institute, for over a decade, and I helped run uh, the largest AI project in U.S. government-funded history called the Kalo Pal Project. It was all about machine learning in the wild. Could you put a system that didn't know how to do anything in particular, but could learn everything about it without any changes to the software, just by observing and interacting with its users and the, the, the environment around it? Uh, so that was exciting. But I guess my, my biggest step forward was when I decided to become an entrepreneur, knowing nothing about entrepreneurship, no business school, you know, never attended a lecture series like this. I really knew nothing. Um, I ended up uh, starting three companies more or less at the same time. This is not necessarily recommended. Not, not my tip to all your users, but it shows that even if you make mistakes like that, um, you can, um, you can still be successful if you're persistent and a little bit lucky. So Siri was my day job, uh, a company, uh, called Sentient with, I think one with Baba Koja Baba, was one of yes. my co-founders. I think he's been on your panel was my night job. And then, uh, a company called change.org which today is the world's largest petition platform. We're going to hit, I believe, half a billion members sometime in a month or two. So pretty exciting. Um, that was my, my side, side job. And uh, so that, that was pretty much the story. I, uh, uh, with Siri, we started with three co-founders, uh, grew the team to 20 people. We launched a free app in the App Store and then uh, shortly after that, we received this phone call and we hear a voice. Hey, it's Steve. What you doing? <laughs> Want to come over to my house tomorrow? And we're like, Steve Jobs is calling us. It's, it's almost like every entrepreneur's dream. Just start a company, launch an app, Steve Jobs calls. Uh, we went to his house. We talked about technology and the future, uh, where the world was going. Um, he made it clear he wanted to buy our company. And we said, wow, we're flattered. Uh, not interested though. Goodbye. Thank you. And we left. So that, that was almost the end of, of that story. But, uh, he came back with Scott Forstall a, a few months later. Um, we had further discussions. Uh, he convinced us he understood my big vision of what I meant Siri to be and that he would support it. And so we decided that we could change the world more with Apple than without. And I went there, I led um, really all the AI and server side aspects of Siri as we built the Siri you all know and love in the iPhone today and all the other Apple devices. Uh, I stayed there two and a half years. Um, there, uh, Siri launched on October 4th, 2011. So just a little more than 10 years ago and the very next day, Steve Jobs died. And so actually one story I have is that um, his admin reached out to me just a few years ago and said, I've been meaning to tell you this for all these years. I didn't know how to contact you. Steve Jobs was clinging to life to see the launch of Siri. It was so important to him. He, he needed to see the launch. And I like to think that he saw, he knew where we wanted to go with it. He knew that this would be the future and said, Apple will be dominant for the next 10 years. I can go now. And, uh, so he, he died. Um, there was a lot of org change in Apple after that. Uh, unfortunately I got unlucky. I didn't, I wasn't compatible with one of the, 
engineering manager changes above me. Uh, so I left because I felt my vision would not be pursued in the way that it had been committed to. Um, took some time off and then said, well, I don't need Apple. I'm going to do it my way and started a new company called Viv Labs. Uh, after four years, we sold it to Samsung. And now our technology is in hundreds of millions of devices from phones to smartwatches to refrigerators to speakers to all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, stayed there for four years and, and here I am uh, talking with you. That is amazing. What a, what a great story. And I think, you know, it's so, it, it, it almost feel like, you know, your story that Steve Jobs died the day after Siri was launched. In some way or fashion, he gave voice to the Apple products through Siri and there's some part of him still kind of, you know, lurking around, if you will, in the back end, <laughs> at least in spirit, you know. So it's a, it's a fascinating story. And Bixby, like I, uh, we have a, a Samsung Family Hub refrigerator, so yeah. I use it all the time, right? I mean, it just like, uh, and it's at probably, I'm pretty, I don't, I don't know whether it's true or not, but does Samsung have more devices that are running Bixby than Apple has that's run Siri? Uh, I don't know. I don't think they released their numbers publicly. Siri has been out much longer than Bixby. That's true. So I think I added up just like how many devices has Siri been on? And it's, you know, because just by looking at estimates of the number of iPhones shipped plus the number of, you know, Apple TVs and smartwatches and whatever, and it, it's definitely more than 2 billion devices. Uh, Samsung, I, I know that Bixby's in its first year was on hundreds of millions of devices, but I think it'll take uh, a while for the full rollout to happen. Samsung has a device footprint of a billion devices. So they have a billion devices at any time out in the world. So I think the potential for Bixby uh, is to be on more devices than on Siri, but no. That is amazing. I mean, what a story. I mean, uh, it just it's just so inspiring to hear you tell your story and how, I mean, the, truly making an impact to the world, right? I'm sure, you know, there, this is this is amazing. Now, before we go into AI and talk about all the great things about AI, you're a magician. You're a professional magician. How did that come about? Tell, tell me that part of the story. Sure. Well, I, I wouldn't go quite that far. I would say uh, mag magic is my hobby. So I'm not a professional magician, um, but it's a pat, you know, whenever I get interested in something, I go deep, right? I, I go way deep. So I'm, I'm lucky enough to spend time with David Copperfield and Shin Lim in Las Vegas and they, you know, David Blaine and, and, you know, get to work with and interact with some of the, some of the best professional magicians in the world. But for me, it's, it's just fun. Um, how did it happen? So, you know, just like I think most who get into magic uh, started when I was 10 years old. Uh, I was growing up, you know, this is a long time ago before the Internet. I didn't even have color TV yet. And uh, so I was bored a lot of the time. And um, this world of magic was filled with colorful, powerful, creative individuals. And something about that really appealed to me. So I got in, I read, I, I performed magic shows at, you know, friends' birthday parties. And then I left it behind for 35 years. But when my son came of age, being a young teenager, um, he started to get interested and he found this box of all my old stuff from long ago. And magic was something we could share, something we could do together. And any time, anything you can bond over with a teenage son is like gold to a parent. So that really got me into it. And we, we did many different things. Um, but like I said, I tend to go deep. And now I see huge parallels between my work as an entrepreneur and my work as a magician. And the reason is, if you think about it, both a magician and an entrepreneur need to imagine an impossible future, right? If you're, if you're starting a company, don't start a company to build something that exists already. You have to reach further and, and imagine something that doesn't exist yet and have a vision for it. 
and it has to be desirable and magical. Think of Steve Jobs. When you went to a Steve Jobs product reveal, it wasn't a tech session. It wasn't a demo. It was a magic show. Everyone talks about Steve's halo and it wasn't about how many gigabytes. It was about the feeling that what he made you feel in that room. And when he revealed something, you know, uh, the iPhone, a Siri, this was, you know, if you went 15 years ago and you told someone 20 years ago and you said, oh, we're going to carry around a supercomputer in your pocket. And, and, and it'll know not only where you are, but who you are. And, and you can talk to it and it'll talk back to you. And you can not only access most of the information, recorded information in the world, but you can also, it'll perform tasks for you and book restaurants and buy you tickets. You would have said, ah, that's science fiction, that's magic. And yet it's technology, right? So a magician and an entrepreneur imagine an impossible desirable future and then they work backwards and they figure out the math and science to make it come true, to bend the laws of physics, if need be, um, to, to make that come true. And I, I find that fascinating. Plus, magicians often can do it with a certain style and Flair. presentation appeal yeah. that that carries over a lot into business. If you're a tech entrepreneur trying to sell to VCs, having, you know, a little bit of training as a magician, I think, uh, is, goes a long way. That yes. is amazing. That is amazing. So I, you know, I, I, uh, I gotta confess and like when I was, um, I grew up in Southern India, I was 10 years old, 11 years old. I got into magic as well. And I played around with right. it and stuff. And I remember, you know, probably going to 20 odd different libraries, like catching buses to go different things to find yeah. books that I can learn. And there wasn't many. I found one book in a different language that I couldn't read. And I it was on hypnotism. And I got that book and I picked a, a book to learn that language as well. And then just like, you know, I just try to actually go do it. But, you know, it was so hard as a 10 year old to practice hypnotism. But uh, I, I, I have to confess, I did have that thing. Maybe I'll pick it up when my son becomes a teenager and he gets interested in it too. You, you should at, at Viv Labs, we had the slogan for our startup. You always need a cultural thing to bind people together where our thing was AI is magic was the slogan. And so every Friday for five years, we had uh, Friday was Viv Labs Magic Friday, every Friday. Nice. And we would have a magic show of some sort. Uh, and we, we would initially, it was myself performing something. I would teach employees to give, if they wanted to learn, I would teach them something and they would have to stand up in front of the whole company and present and learn how to do this. But we also had some of the best magicians in the world and we even had a hypnotist, uh, which was one of the most interesting and discussed uh, Friday magic sessions we ever we ever had. So I think, you know, weaving magic into technology, into business, making it fun, uh, making it cultural, I think uh, can be really effective. People it's, loved it. It's amazing. I, I love how you also framed it, like the the paddles between entrepreneurship and and magic, right? You're you're imagining and you have to communicate and captivate the audience, whoever it is, customers, partners, VCs, yeah. of this impossible future that is purely magical and then work backwards from it. It's beautiful, uh, well said. And you also said AI and magic, AI is magic. Explore that for me. I mean, is there something deeper there other than the cultural element of how, how, how is AI and machine learning really magic? Well, it is. I mean, I think many people, when you enter into computer science, you learn programming. And, you know, it seems like a mysterious field. But once you achieve a certain level of proficiency, you're like, oh, I get it. It's me telling instructions in a precise way to make the machine perform a certain operation. It's really not magic. It's pretty straightforward. But AI and machine learning is different. So with AI, you take a, a model, a machine learning model, maybe a neural network or a genetic algorithm, and it's, it's not 
designed for any particular purpose. But then typically you will give it input data and output data pairs. You say, if I give you this input, this is what I want, ex expect as output. Yep. If I give you this different out input, this is what I want as output. And you give it to the machine without explaining what to do. Sure. You don't, you don't explain what the differences are, what it is that makes one different. You just give raw input, raw output. And then over time, the system, as you show it more examples, it adapts and it comes up with its own solution not your solution, its own solution on how to do this, solve this problem. And in fact, the, the machine learning researcher who gave it all those examples and even set up the model in the first place has no idea, has no understanding how or why the system works to achieve it. So at some level, yeah. even for the, the researcher building it, it feels there's like a little element of magic, whereas in programming, it's not magic. I say X equals 10, X equals X plus one, now X equals 11, not yeah. magic. Not magic. You, but you, you say, here's you know a, a, an, an example where it first was like hammered into me was the example of text-to-speech, which is used in Siri, when Siri talks to you in a voice. People say, well, how did text-to-speech work? In the old days, around the 80s, it was all about expert systems. And what AI was then was rules. So to build a text-to-speech system, you would bring in a world's expert, a linguist, who would know all the rules of how to pronounce a language. If you have the letter A and there's two consonants, it's then A. And if you have a letter A followed by one consonant with an E, it's a, pronounced A, etc. You just type in all these rules but they were always wrong and there were too many of them. Well, a, a machine learning researcher, Terry Sejanowski, he took a model and he took a dictionary and he just started passing words in through it where he said, here's the word, because every word in the dictionary, and here's the pronunciation as the output, because every dictionary has the word and the pronunciation. He just ran it through and the system learned how to pronounce English, no rules. I'm like, oh my gosh, if he wanted to do that with that another language that he didn't even know, he could feed it in, same model, no work, magic. Now it speaks this other language. So that, that for me, there is a little element of magic in AI. I think it's, it's uh, amazing and machine no, learning. I, I totally agree, actually. In fact, it's, it's the same level of wonder that ML ops people also come in, or sometimes the business users, when you get a prediction, you're like, how the hell did you come up with that? <laughs> so, so no, it, it makes sense. No, but it's it's a very um, interesting parallel that you draw, and it's so true, right? Because there is an element of uh, magic. As somebody said, I don't remember who made this quote. Almost for any technology, when it becomes really indistinguishable from magic, yeah. is when you, you know, achieve. Yeah. Ar Arthur C. Arthur C. Clarke. Clark. He right. said, "Any sufficiently advanced technology." is indistinguishable from magic. And if you think about it, magicians and science, magicians were often the first people to apply science. So you go back to uh, Jean-Robert Houdin, a French magician, really the father of modern magic. He would perform for emperors and kings in Europe. Um, and he had something called the light heavy case. He'd bring a little suitcase. A, a kid would come out with a suitcase and put it down. And then the strongest armed guard of, of the, the prince couldn't lift this little box. And it was electromagnetism was the secret. But back then in the 1800s, no one knew about electromagnetism, right? A light, heavy box. Um, as examples more recently, so I, I've been on the, the magic TV show called Penn and Teller Fool Us but I've also worked behind the scenes uh, with magicians who are on that. I worked with a uh, former world champion magician, Boris Wild. you can look up his episode. And in this episode, um, Penn's, Penn's voice is speaking during his episode. And while he was filming it, I was sitting next to Penn's wife 
Uh, and, and she turned to me and she said, how did he ever get Penn to say those things? And I go, oh, that's not Penn. And she's like, what do you mean? I'm his wife. If he used a voice impersonator, I would know. <laughs> uh, I'm telling you, it's not Penn. And she goes, well, how do you know? And I said, is there anything you've ever wanted Penn to say to you, your husband to say to you? And she gave me a line. I said, give me a second. And then I emailed her an audio file of her husband's voice saying those exact words. And so while Boris Wilde was fooling Penn on stage, I was in a sense <laughs> fooling his wife because I helped create the technology that was used to, you know, do a deep fake voice clone of person. I think it's the first time ever used in magic. We all know it's coming, but here it was used in a magic context. Or uh, the metaverse is a big topic. Uh, I was lucky enough to perform, I think, in the first uh, magic show and magic conference ever to take place in the metaverse, uh, which was literally every person around the world was wearing uh, the audience members, the participants were wearing Oculus or yep. similar headsets, took place in a theater, and it was, but it was a magic show. And it was an interesting question how do you perform magic when everything is just a pixel? floating and disappearing and all of these things don't matter anymore how do you fool the mind in the metaverse so magicians and technology have long had synergy and um you know they're applying technology trying to use the latest technology the sufficiently advanced technology bring it to people as magic you know you're 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 so inspiring me to go pick up magic right after this <laughs> Yeah, Absolutely. This is amazing. This That's is amazing. Good. You know, uh, yeah. let's, let's switch gears and talk about AI a little bit, right? And uh, one of the things that you mentioned, like earlier days where you have expert systems and, uh, you know, symbolic logic kind of approaches to AI, and now more recently with the advent of deep learning and more statistical machine learning, you've swung the pendulum a little too much on this side, which is everything is data-driven machine learning, Right. And one of the things that you see, I see at least outside in, and I've been in the industry uh, with AI for the last decade as well, is you were doing much harder problems early on. And more of the common, I'm not saying that you're not solving hard problems anymore, but the purely data-driven approaches is used to solve problems that are you know, usually glorified statistics with better computing, right? How, where in the world is AI today? I mean, like, I, I see this, you know, there is a there's an opportunity to combine the approaches. But where in the world is AI today? What do you see from your vantage point? Yeah, I've been um, I've been a professional AI developer since 1986. Uh, so I've had the luxury to program on Lisp machines, doing expert systems in the 80s, work on uh you know, then the 90s came and there was a, you know, back then, AI meant expert systems. Yes. Then in the 90s, it was kind of an AI winter. AI was a bad word. No one would say artificial intelligence because it had failed. It didn't live up. The 80s expert systems didn't live up to the promises that AI was going to bring. So no one would use those words. So they flipped the letters. So in the 90s, it was about IA intelligent assistance. So back then I was working on my first versions of Siri like systems, uh, in many ways, far more advanced than anything that we have today out in the market, more advanced than a Siri or Bixby in some dimensions. Um, then in the 2000s, it kind of went quiet. The word AI didn't get used much. There wasn't, wasn't discussed much, at least in my impression. And then 2010, um, it started to come again, like what? as an exciting word. Yeah. And I actually give credit to Steve Jobs, not for creating it, but for seeing the avalanche before anyone else did. So if you look at Steve, he, he, was, he didn't invent the mouse, but he knew, or Windows, but he saw it and then brought it to the masses. Uh, he didn't invent um, Pixar and animated movies, but he saw it before anyone else invested in it and brought us Toy Story, the first movie 
that Amazing. was different, right? He, he, he saw computing, he saw mobile, he saw, he saw all of these trends and helped influence them. And if you think about it, the timing, so 2010, the small little AI startup came out it's called Siri, launched a free app. We were just one out of 2 million apps in the app store, free app you could download. He saw it and called our office. And then what happened a, a year after he bought Siri, someone said, why did you buy that? Uh, it was at the Walt Mossberg at the D7, D8 conference. I said, why did you buy that search company? And he goes, it's not a search company. It's an artificial intelligence company. And no one knew what he was talking about. They didn't know, like no one had used the words in a decade or, or more. And then there was this chain of events. IBM Watson uh, all of a sudden beats the world's best players at Jeopardy, 2011. Yep. Um, 2012, the movie, Her, you know, Her starts to be made. Yep. 2013, Google, a search company, buys eight robot companies. Uh, 2015, Tesla comes out with a self-driving car as an over-the-air update. You know, do, do, do. Machine learning is starting to explode. Yep. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is the rage. And he was the first one to say, no, no, they're an AI company before it was a thing. So yeah, the, the 2010s till now have been a lot about AI. And as you mentioned, with a huge emphasis on machine learning, um, to me, I've seen the ups and downs over time. I've seen expert systems was it. I've seen, no, it's not. Don't talk about AI. Oh, maybe it's the artificial, you know, uh, 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 intelligent assistance. I've seen it go up and down. Today, machine learning is it. Hmm. But I just, from my perspective, I'm like, yes, machine learning is, is amazing for certain types of things. It has great strengths. Uh, it has huge weaknesses too. Right. In the same way, when you say, wow, what insight? How did the system know that? It will also go, oh, my God, how could it not know that? Why did it miss that? And you can't explain either. Right. A huge problem. Um, so and, and for me, it's there's this huge spectrum of AI. There used to be about you know, ontologies and representation and reasoning and expert systems and planning and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And machine learning was one piece. And within the machine learning field, there were genetic algorithms, neural networks. Within neural networks, there were rec recurrent neural networks. Et cetera. And so now one little piece has blown up to, to be almost associated today with AI. And I think that's a little overblown I think it will swing back once, you know, well, oh, maybe you can't do everything with recurrent neural networks. Maybe there is this hybrid that will emerge uh, that, yep. that you refer to. And I think there's absolutely room for it. No, it's actually interesting. You know, it's, it's like right in the original vision. I think it was the Dartmouth conference or right after somebody described it. AI is a bag of tools for a bag of problems. Right. And it's exactly <laughs> true even today. Right. I think there is the the market hype that gets take, uh, taken on. And, and it, what, one thing I must say is machine learning has made AI more approachable for most people. Right. I mean, from a fact that all you need to do is learn a little bit of coding in some high level language like Python, no, learn statistics and have data and you can do some magic. Right. All of a sudden. Right. Which was really hard to do you know, 20 years ago, because you had to, I mean, you also had to worry about the infrastructure, setting it up, the whole, you know, and, and logic wasn't an easy topic for people to pick up and learn, right? So definitely has to give credit to that in the in the industry. Uh, what are organizations today? I mean, how are organizations embracing AI, adopting AI? I mean, because one of the things that I see, I mean, I think it's very clear that the most resourced organizations that has a lot of the ability to attract and hire expensive talent, have good research pockets, have access to the data of the customers and an intuitive feedback loop with the users, like Facebook, like Apple, like um, you know Amazon for that matter, Netflix. They have great made great strides in AI, but where is the average organization compared to them in their journey with AI? So 
That's a great question. So for me, I think you you actually hit on a lot of the right pieces. One is AI is a tool, and it is a powerful tool for solving uh, pointed problems. Like if you have a specific decision to make in your company, you can probably do better applying AI as a tool to help you make that decision, not to make the decision for you, but to help you make that decision. So that is one. I think companies that understand that um, will gain benefit. I also do think that, as you mentioned, there's been a lot of investment over this past decade in AI and in packaging AI so that, that, that um, the cost and the barrier to entry yeah. is way lower Yep. than it was 10 years ago. So at some level, I feel that if you're a business who's not using AI, you're not meaning in ways to help you optimize and improve your decision making, your questions, your you know how you're doing your business, you're probably missing out. And likely your competitors are starting to look at it and that may be a problem. Um, so, Often the question is, well, but, um, you know, do I have to be an expert in AI? You know, it's good to have expertise in AI, but the hard part is really knowing where to apply it and how to apply it. So Mark Cuban said something like uh, the first trillionaire will be someone who masters the right way to apply AI in a new way. That's his prediction. And so that application of where do you put it and how do you use this tool, I think still allows for a lot of creativity. And I've seen businesses doing all sorts of things. So uh, at Sentient, we worked with companies um, to help introduce AI in all sorts of areas. I saw it in agriculture. We teamed with the MIT um, open ag project where they were building a food cube, literally uh, a container like environment that is completely instrumented and they would grow food inside of it. They could control humidity and temperature and soil and nutrients. But it's interesting that even though we've been growing food for 10,000 years, we don't know the optimal way to grow food. And AI actually could help us learn new things about growing food that we didn't know before. I mean, that's an innovative application uh, of this uh, and, and many other areas. So for me, I think if you're a business starting to think about where are the opportunities, what's known, what's not known, what, um, what might be known and how do I get there? I think that's a huge part of innovation that, that businesses need to be thinking about today. Awesome. No, it's so true. And in fact, I think one of the things you touched upon is what is needed to know where to apply AI, right? Or even more broadly, system level thinking. And that's another observation that I had. AI developers and scientists 20 years ago were really, really good system level thinkers, right? Compared to, I think, one of the skills that we need to impart on our machine learning and data scientists today is more start thinking at a system level than at a small problem level, right? So, I mean, one of the classic adoption challenges is like sci data scientists and ML engineers, you know, figure out a really awesome model to predict sales, um, you know, uh, forecasting, and then throw it over to the uh, fence to the salespeople. They look at it and say, I don't believe it. I'm not going to use it, right? Well, theoretically, it may be the best accurate model, but as a system, it's not really serving the purpose because they're not driving the adoption. And the issue there might be, how do you build trust with that user? How do you actually make sure that you capture what the person knows in addition to what the machine tells, right? And then augment your machine to actually learn from that and so forth. So it requires a much more broader system level thinking. But you no, know, you, to your point, I think, um, you know, when I got into AI, this like, you know, early 2000s was also, we were like, it was still all about telling people, telling organizations and saying, you have to do AI. Let me tell you what AI is. Let me demystify it for you. To so now become almost a call to action. If you're not embracing this powerful technology to go transform your business, you're going to be left behind because others are doing it, right? So yeah. that's awesome. 
Um, Adam, another topic in your life that is very strong and very, very clear is the change.org, the social causes, right? So, um, you know, and, and it's amazing that you built change.org and Sentient and Siri at the same time. That's amazing. But back to the point on AI today is primarily concentrated and used by the big tech. Um, and they power a lot of things. We have great examples like, I mean, horrible examples like Cambridge Analytica, how the powerful technology, the, the, the wisdom of the network and the ability to influence networks and factions of population through powerful technology like AI can really lead to very adverse consequences, right? How do you, and I also want to, um, you know, I think it was um, uh, Sam Altman also wrote that piece on how we should think about an automated future and what can the society do to get out of it. So how do you see the social impact of this powerful technology that's AI? Are we going to see, I mean, obviously the obvious answers are automation, job displacement and stuff, but there's something more deeper here. Well, so one, yeah, that's a, that's a big complicated question. I think with, with work, um, on change.org, you know, AI is artificial intelligence. For me, change.org is one of the few shining examples of CI, which is collective intelligence. It's about people. And, uh, these two threads have been the two helixes, the double helix of my life swirling around each other. Um, I was lucky enough to work um, for a number of years with Doug Engelbart. Um, he's the creator of much of the technology that we know today. When you think of the mouse, oh, he had the patent. Uh, Windows um, and, and interactive personal computing with text editors and email, he created all of that. Uh, in the 60s. Everything we know of the web, meaning multimedia, hyperlinked documents that can be collaborated on and, and published in a distributed way, he had that in the 60s. Um, everything we know about video conferencing and collaboration technology, like real-time document editing, video conferencing like we do, uh, we're doing right now, he had that in the 60s. But why did he do all of this? Uh, create all of this technology, he said, someday the world is going to be faced with everly complex global issues. And he listed these issues, pandemics, climate change, hunger, poverty, water, human rights, animal rights, and more. He said, unless we get better at global problem solving and at collective intelligence, we will not survive as a species. So he was all about how do you harness the collective IQ? He coined the term collective IQ uh, of the planet to solve the biggest problems we're going to be faced with. And that was his driving force. So for me, change.org, you know, um, change.org was started by Ben Rattray, Mark Dimas. I was a, the first developer there, founding member. I'm very proud to, of my association with, but they get all of the credit um, for the su incredible success and growth. But it's an example, change.org is an example where every day problems are being not only identified, but solved by harnessing people's ideas about what, how the world can be a better place and people voting through a simple click on a petition of, yeah, I think this idea could work. I think this idea should be implemented. And just by getting a couple hundred thousand clicks, that shines a spotlight on a particular person or organization. So the question is, uh, AI has incredible benefit. AI also has negative consequences and can be applied in ways that, in a sense, divide us, right? AI is about partitioning and, and, and forming groups and, and, and really keeping those groups distinct and apart from each other, right? Because that way the model is more accurate to predict. Sure. If you can just you get each create. group and, and identify them, now you can beam the right ad or the right whatever targeted to that group. But CI is the opposite. Things like Wikipedia, things like change.org is about bringing people together, maybe with different viewpoints, 
um, letting them share and compete and dialogue and cooperate and argue, and, and, but around one central issue. Uh, if you think about you know, Facebook dividing us as an example into a left and a right in this country and, and having no middle ground where we don't, we don't, you know, the media, we don't consider, we don't hear the same messages at all. There's no middle ground. There's no common ground. Um, collective IQ sites like take uh, Wikipedia, there's only one web page on Donald Trump. And that forces everyone to, to come together to a common page to dispute what is the record that gets written there. That's bringing people together. So I, you talked about hybrid of AI. Um, I think another hybrid that needs to come together is the right mix of AI and CI, where AI is a tool that maybe helps bring people together, that helps uh, identify areas where we have conflict because conflict and disagreement is interesting. If we agree on, if everyone agrees on something, we don't need to think about it or talk about it. If we disagree, now that's interesting. Let's see if we can come together and figure out more about what's the right, you know, truth or what's the right path forward or what's the right solution. That's where we need to come together to talk about. So AI can be used in many ways. Um, when you talk about societal problems, I think we need ways to, to try to bring people together uh, as opposed to today, it's often being used to partition and separate people into nicely targetable separate groups. Um, and I, I think that's a, a problem. No, it's, 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 it's amazing, you know, collective intelligence. And, you know, although on the one hand, I do think that, you know, when you purely take the wisdom of the numbers, like, which is also what you do in AI, but even in a collective intelligence votes, you know, people, more and more people, majority versus minority, it still doesn't really shine light to the color of the context of the discussion, right? So, and that's where I think pure, rather than, you know, pure number plays like the current voting system, for example, right? I mean, of course, it's very powerful as democracy and stuff, but add more, adding more context to those, those decisions and bringing people together to actually make those decisions is a huge opportunity with, you know, powerful technologies like AI. That was fascinating. Oh, what, a, what an amazing piece of discussion. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for your insight here. Now, if you were a business in AI today, how should you think about governing your AI initiatives to mostly, you know, to reduce reputational harm or like, unintended consequences, or even for that matter, you know, intended bad consequences, you know, Facebook, AKA. Um, how, how should you think about it if you're a business? Yeah, boy, you, you ask tough questions. These are things that we could talk about in many ways. Um, you know, that gets into, you know, often AI aspects are around bias and ethics. Um, privacy is a huge issue. Like there are a number of these kind of hot button topics that when you're in AI that you do need to think about. Um, and I think in most cases, um, privacy is important. You'll need to fit, you know, there's this, this duality of AI privacy versus convenience and trying to figure out the right line is hard, right? Because AI is about, oh, if I learn more about you, I can help you better in a more targeted way. I can help you, you know, find the ad that might be what you're looking for, right? Rather than just show you some generic ad that's not even relevant to you or help you automate a task in a way that, because I know how you're going to want to do it, I shouldn't have to ask you every time, right? So there's improvements that can be made once it knows more about you, but that comes at a cost of, well, it knows some things about you. And so I'd say the first topic is really around, you, you need to kind of look at, at AI and, and have someone be thinking about that trade-off 
of where do you as a company want to be um, and and maybe having options to allow your um, your customers to to have different levels. So for instance, it, in general, Apple has come down on the side of more for privacy, right? And they can do a lot, but, but it's in their interest because they don't have a huge search engine. They don't, they don't rely on ads. They want to sell you phones, right? So, you know, I work there. I know that they were really internally really, really caring about the privacy of consumers. And there was an internal task force um, who literally would go after every system like hackers and guarantee um, that there was, you know, they would check the databases that there was no identifiable, identifiable information. They would, they would cripple their own systems um, to protect the privacy because um, you know, someone would be uh, undoubtedly called up in front of Congress yes. and they wanted to be able to say, look, we can't give you the keys. We don't even, there's no way we can identify that user in our own databases. So we can't give you access to it, even if you give us a government court order. That That's one decision. But other companies will rely much more on ads. It's, it's, it's trickier, right? That's how they make their money. So... Privacy is a big issue. Bias is an issue. Bias, remember, it's not the algorithm's fault if what it spits out um, it overrepresents a majority versus a minority. In a sense, it's a reflection back on the of the data that we give the algorithm. It's showing us patterns in our society because largely we'll get the data from just what's out there easily accessible, Very true. but that's not balanced, right? If you type in CEO and you get lots of pictures of old white men and you give that to an al algorithm and, and you type, you know, and that's what it gives you back. Yeah. That's, it's, it's a reflection of our current society and that needs to be changed. So it raises, you know, outrage will often come, come against the AI system that reflects it. Yeah. But really, it's saying to us, look, we need to change our representations Our, we need to change our, re, you know, our, our uh, just how we're reflecting and, and presenting the things to ourselves, our own biases. And so I, I often see AI in those kind of more ethical sure. aspects as as raising ethics against how we are presenting the data to ourselves, not being fair, balanced, and even accurate. Yeah. And, and so, so it, in a way, it's often a tool um, you know, to help realize how we're failing in, in certain aspects. It's so funny, you, you say like one, one little, um, you know, kind of a sidebar there. If you really search for tech CEOs today, you'll probably get yeah. middle-aged brown people. <laughs> you know? Yeah, no, well, they're all Indian. <laughs> Many are Indian. So if they you look at the top tech companies. I mean, true, right. Yeah. So, but but your point, I think you you na you you nailed it. Where, but, but they'll be male. They'll be male and not be male, female. Not female, exactly. Or, so, or what have you, and and so maybe that's not that's right. Not, maybe, and that's just our society today. And it's not representative. So it, exactly. It's not it, representative of what it needs to be, right? And 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 I think I think few few things, right, that I could like gleam out of this. One governing AI and decisions and you know how you ethically and responsibly use this is often not necessarily just a technology decision, right? Or, or a technology problem. It's to begin with, like you talked about the ad business model versus not, right? It's an incentive problem, right? That we need to actually go solve, right? The second thing also, the, the bias, and I you put it so beautifully, the bias that you see is because of the bias in the data and probably even the people who build the algorithms and so forth. But it's a reflection of the state of the affairs. It's looking backwards, right? And which is an interesting, um, you know, conundrum. But it's, it's, prompt, it's propagating in a sense, it's in this self-reflective loop. Exactly. Where it's taking all the, the biases and flaws of yesterday and projecting, and projecting them and, and accentuating them going forward, That's which is not necessarily what we want to do. And so what I would say is each organization 
should have at least one person in their organization whose job is to represent the other side. The there are going to be people trying to solve the technology problem as accurately as possible. There are going to be people who solve the business problem as accurately as possible. And there should be someone looking for and complaining when things are not as they should be going forward, right? There is a role, like when you do hiring, for instance, there should be a person, forget AI, just in hiring, there should be a person saying, we need more diversity. Well, we need that person for the data that's being fed to the AI system. So having a person whose job is to be that voice Absolutely. and be in that discussion, I think is important for, for every organization, not just for AI, but for many aspects Absolutely. of business. No, Adam, I think so, so eloquently put. I think it also highlights in a nutshell that AI is a tool and when you augment the human being and you put the man and the human and the machine together is when you actually drive optimal outcomes. Um, I have one last question for you. I know we are running a little out of time. I would love to go on for another few hours with you, but I know I want to respect your, your time. You also been doing a lot of, um, you know, work with about life and career, and you had some amazing advice and some amazing frameworks for people to think about as they think about what they want to do with their lives. Right. Is there anything that you can quickly share uh, with the audience here? I, I'll, I'll try to tell you my most important secret, not my magic secret, but my secret to success. Yes. Uh, so I, I, I label it with three initials, VSG, which stands for verbally stated goal, verbally stated goal. So here's how it works as quickly as I can express it. Um, you know, life is short and life is a gift and is valuable. I don't know why I'm here, but I know our job is to make the most of it. So in life, you're going to come, you know, you're going to be happy sometimes and fulfilled, but that's not going to last because you're a different person tomorrow than you were today. And things so. life changes and you change. So at some point you're going to be frustrated or, or wanting, or you'll just be a different person. Maybe you just got married or you just graduated school and you're going to come to these chapter changes. Mm -hmm. And many times people fear change, but I think chapter changes are the most interesting times in life. And you'll, you'll know them. You've all had them. I'm sure. Yep. Yep. So when you come to a chapter change, you say, okay, life is important. So, my goal is to maximize the time I have spent for this next chapter. And the way you do it is you focus on what's the core emotion that you're feeling at this end of the chapter. So like when I got married, it was the first time I, I, I felt like I had a financial need. Like now I have to provide for someone. I need to, you know, I need to provide to have a family. That was a new need that I never had before. Um, at one time I was frustrated with my job and feeling stifled. And, and so that feeling stifled and, and having ideas and wanting to do impactful things, like what I was working on wasn't important, but that was my core emotion. Once I have the emotion, I turn that feeling in my chest, that truth that is resonating in my chest into words. That's the goal part. And then I tell everyone I meet, this is what I'm going to do. That's the verbally stated part, verbally stated goal. So when I was feeling that emotion of oh, what I'm working on in my job is not going anywhere. It, there's politics. I have all these ideas, but I can't get them implemented. My verbally stated goal was five projects that can impact users in 2007. And my verbally stated goal for 2008 was one major, one minor. So what were those five? So I built on my own time while I had a day job, I created all these project ideas. And then 2008, one major, one minor, my idea was to take two of them, the best two out of the five and start companies around them. That's how, and I ended up actually doing three. 
Um, but you can see that it starts with an emotion. You, you form it into words as clear and concise and actionable as possible. You tell people, even though you have no idea how you're going to do it, and two things happen, people will, will uh, first of all, telling people person after person, it starts to commit yourself to this goal. Even if you have no idea, you know you're gonna meet them again. They're gonna say, oh, how's that goal going for you? You're like, I better get working on this, right? So it commits you to it, and then people start to help you. Oh, I have an idea. I know this person you should talk to. So by putting it out into the world, it actually moves you forward. And that I've done that since graduating. My first one was when I graduated college. I'm like, what do I do now? How do I decide? Focused on emotion. I put it out into the world, and then I made that come true. And I've done it every Every couple of years, a new chapter has happened for me for my whole life. It's every success that I've been lucky to have from finding the woman I love to, to starting companies to um, having a family to all of this came from verbally stated goals. So that's my best uh, that is, tip. That is just people. so profound, so amazing. And, you know, it kind of also reaffirms a lot of the other, you know, well-researched topics, right? Affirmations work. I mean, the fact that you, yeah. when you're, when you're vulnerability, when you're actually vi verbally stating it to somebody, you're being vulnerable, you're asking for help mm -hmm. and the universe conspires to make it happen for you. One of my, yes. one of my most favorite books uh, that I read quite a bit. And, and I, one of my most favorite books is the Brian Doty's Into the Magic Shop. I don't know whether you've read that. It's a, no, it's a beautiful like book, and you would love it because it's magic, right? I'll 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 send you a copy. I used to actually give this oh, to okay. everybody I know, right? And he talks about the same thing, right? Uh, stated goals, affirmations, intentions, setting intentions, um, and then you know there's a lot of practices that he talks about. But it's his life story. It's a real story how he went from a kid in a broken home to the world's one of the best neurosurgeons to be a successful entrepreneur to really crashing and burning in the 2000s to coming back up in his life. So it just is a beautiful story that touches upon a lot of things that you're talking about. Adam, thank you Wonderful. so much. This has been amazing. I can go on and on and on forever. Uh, I have one last question for you. Um, personal question. What is one personal power practice that you employ? It may be the same thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious if you have something that you do regularly outside of the visually stated goals that keeps you at the top of the game? Well, you know, I, I, I'm a morning person. I wake up early and I usually wake up feeling I'm gonna change the world. And, um, uh, but I would say the, the power practice that I have stems from uh, my wife. I found the woman who I wanna be with forever and I wanna be more for forever. Right. So every time I create something new, it's to make her fall in love with me <laughs> even more. Right. I want to be more generous, more giving, more impactful, more successful, more intelligent, more handsome, more whatever it is. It comes from this this desire to love her more and have her love me more. And that's that's the, the source of any power that I have. And so I'd say the power practice is. I wake up every day, I tell her and verbalize how much, how important she is for me. Uh, and she knows that she's the source of, of my power. So yeah, I, that's, that's how I that is such, that. such a, such a beautiful thing. And it's a great practice. And I think everybody who wants to remain happily married should practice that. That's an amazing <laughs> piece of advice. No, Adam, this has been a blast. Really, really awesome. Thank you for sharing your wisdom. How can the viewers and listeners get in touch with you? Where can they find you on the internet? Sure, I have a, a personal website, adam.chire.com, C-H-E-Y-E-R. So my, my contact information's there, or you can find me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Um, but yes. Thank you, thank you, Adam. Thanks a lot for taking the time, such a blast. Okay, thank you, Ganesh, this was a lot of fun.